the book of Genesis? Does anyone know at least the month we started? Last September 2016. And we're going to finish on August 13, 2017. Almost an entire year of our preaching has been devoted to the book of Genesis. And I hope that, um, I really hope that you've gained a lot. And I, and I pray that God has spoken to you through this marvelous book that he's provided. Um, but I was kind of thinking, just to, just to see how effective my preaching is and how well you listen, I was thinking we finish on August 13. On August 20, when we come to church, I thought we could have an exam. And what we'll do, we'll do Scantron, we'll pass it around, and then I'll just ask you questions and you can fill in the bubble. And then we'll take your results and we'll post your results on the PowerPoint. And so everyone can see how well you listened in the last year. How does that sound? <laughs> Nervous laughter. I, I bet, um, what do you guys think, attendance will drop on August 20? I think so. Um, <laughs> you know, tests are an interesting thing, aren't they? And I don't know, um, I know I don't look forward to tests. But yet, you know what? Tests are an essential part of life. And we serve a God who, uh, who says that he tests us. And he tests us in different circumstances. You know, sometimes God will put us through a really difficult situation because he wants to test us through that situation. Sometimes God will put us in a situation of blessing. And he will pour out his blessings upon us so that he can see how we're going to use his blessing. Sometimes, maybe you've been here before, um, Sometimes God brings us like to the end of our rope and we have nothing left to give And God wants to see what we're going to do when we get to that point other times God fills us with more energy than we need And he wants to see what we're going to do with the energy that he gives us But here's the thing God does test us And I want to start this sermon we're going to be talking about testing in the story today in the book of genesis But I want to just explore first of all the question of why does God test us? And I think the best way to answer that question is simply to go and see what God tells us about that. So I want to put a couple scriptures on the screen. The first one in, uh, comes from the book of Deuteronomy. And this is interesting because remember, the book of Genesis was written during the 40 years that the Israelites wandered through the desert. And this is actually a scripture about their wandering through the desert. And here's what God says. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way into the wilderness these 40 years. To humble you and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. You don't know if you're a forgiving person until you're forced to forgive, right? You don't truly know if you're a generous person until you're put in a situation when you have to choose to be generous. You don't know if you're completely sold out to God until you're given choices in front of you and you have to choose to follow him or choose something that feels much better. The truth is, God's tests show what's really in our hearts. Now, let's go on to the next scripture, though, because there's a little bit more God says. This is from Job 23, 10. It talks about why God tests us. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. You see that? God says, I'm testing you so that I can make you into the, perf the person you were created to be, to make you pure and holy and beautiful just as gold is. Now, if you saw, that was written by a man named Job. And you know Job's story. Job just had everything taken away from him. But he's still sharing this testimony about God, God's grace and goodness in the test. And I thought there's one other passage from Job, which I think is really neat. Um, Job says this, and, and remember, Job has lost his house, his family, he's, he's like deadly sick. This man has nothing. And Job says this, What is mankind that you make so much of them, that you give them so much attention, that you examine them every morning and test them in every moment? So you catch what Job is saying here? Job is not looking at his life and just saying, God has provided this test to make me as gold. Job says, wow, can you believe that God Almighty loves me so much that he tests me on a regular basis because of his love that he has for me? Now, today's story, as I said, is about testing. Now, a little context as we get to our text. It's been 25 years since the day that Joseph's brothers took Joseph 
beat him, and sold him as a slave. And for those last 25 years, his brothers have been living that lie. Now listen, a lot can happen in 25 years, can't it? A lot happened in Joseph's life, because as Joseph was sold into slavery, over the course of 25 years, he started as the lowest of slaves in Egypt. And after 25 years, God exalted him to remember to be the second in charge. Pharaoh said, nobody will lift a finger throughout the land, Joseph, unless you tell them to. But a lot can also happen in the human heart as well. Think about this. For 25 years, his brothers have been living with this tremendous lie, okay? But if you also remember, if you were here in the last couple weeks, roughly two years before the story today, um, Joseph's brothers arrived in Egypt to get food because of the famine that God had orchestrated to bring his brothers there. Now, his brothers did not recognize Joseph as they came to get food. And if you remember, the story gets really weird because Joseph begins to put his brothers through literal hell. He freaks them out. He takes one of them as a prisoner. And he puts them through these hard circumstances with one purpose. Joseph is seeing, well, he's trying to help them see their sinfulness and their brokenness. And he's trying to expose it, Okay. But now we're two years later. The famine is still horrible, and the brothers are now coming back to see Joseph again. But Joseph has a plan. He's going to test his brothers because he wants to see, are they the same people they were 25 years ago? Or after 25 years and two years of wrestling with their sin, are they new people today? And so the story goes on from this point. Now, We're going to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 43. They're headed back to Egypt. And because they're terrified of Joseph, they brought all these presents. Now, when they get to Egypt, they they go into the presence of Joseph. And Joseph tells them, hey, listen, we're going to have some food together. You're going to come to my house. We're going to sit down at a table. And so the steward says, I'm going to take you to Joseph's house. Now, this this is not like a pleasant thing they hear. They're absolutely terrified. They think that Joseph plans to bring them to his house so he can surround them and capture them and make them all his slaves. And so they begin to talk with the steward. They say, steward, come on, we brought back all the money you thought we stole even though we didn't. We're good people. We're honest people. And they get this response from the steward. The steward says, it's all right. Don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. I received your silver. Then he brought Simeon out to them. The steward took the men into Joseph's house, gave them water to wash their feet, and provided fodder for their donkeys. They prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon because they heard that they were to eat with them, or eat with him. Now, just look how the story begins, right? They all knew they deserved punishment, and they're trying to get out of it. But what do they meet instead of punishment? They meet grace. Let's go on and see how it unpacks. When Joseph came home, they presented to him the gifts they had brought into the house, and they bowed down before him to the ground. He asked them how they were, and then he said, How is your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? They replied, Your servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they bowed down, prostrating themselves before him. As he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he asked, Is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room, and he wept there. You see, as Joseph starts to test them, you see his heart. This is really hard for him. You know, even the sight of his family makes him want to break down and cry. And there's a couple times in the story when he runs out and he cries, and then he comes back. And let's keep reading verse 31. Now, after he had washed his face, he came out controlling himself, and he said, Serve the food. They served him by himself, the brothers by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that is detestable to Egyptians. The men who had been seated before him, in, the men had been seated before him in the order of their ages, from the firstborn to the youngest, and they looked at each other in astonishment. When portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much 
as anyone else's. Now, stop a second. Think about how amazing this is to the brothers. They have different moms that are pretty close in age. But when Joseph sat them down, Joseph sat them down from youngest all the way to oldest. You see, the scripture said they were astonished. Um, where's my math people? Camille, I know you're here. Is, where, is Doug's not here with you. Oh, he's my math person. Um, any of you other math people here who likes a good math problem? Anybody? John, no one? Okay, fine. Then you can't test my math. But I— <laughs> So you just have to trust me that I'm right. I sat down with my calculator and I calculated the probability of putting them in order perfectly. Do you know what it is? The chances of putting them in order from youngest to oldest, not knowing them, is one out of 481,466,700. But you're going to have to take my word because none of you know how to do the math problem. (laughs) But so Joseph puts them this way and they're astonished. And why? Why? Because Joseph wants to call attention to the order of the family. If you remember way back in the day, in the order of the family before Joseph was sold into slavery, Joseph was God's chosen one and also chosen by his father. He was kind of the privileged and honored one in the family. And it's because of his position of privilege, ultimately, daddy's favoritism, that made all his brothers hate him. Now, second in line is Benjamin. So, he sits them in order to show this is about family order. And then when he serves Benjamin, did you see what he served Benjamin? Five times the portion that everybody got. Now, why does he do this? Here's why. This is where the test begins. You know what he's testing? You see, when he was the favorite and he got special treatment— His brothers hated him for it. But he wants to see if after 25 years and after two years of wrestling with their sin, if the next one gets special treatment, are the brothers going to look at him and start rolling their eyes? Are they going to grimace? Are they going to get irritated that they're not the chosen one like Benjamin? Because Joseph wants to see, has their heart changed over the years? And here's what happens. Scriptures say, they feasted, And drank, what? Freely with him. Free from bitterness. Free from anger. Free from jealousy. And so now after all those years, they're okay with the fact that they're not the chosen one. They've learned to have peace with it. And see, now we take the report card. See, I won't put your answers in front of the church, but I'll put his answers in front of the church. That's okay. So first thing have learned to be at peace with their position. What do you think? Have they passed the test? Yes, I gave them an A. All right, let's keep going. Um, Genesis chapter 44, verse 1, the test isn't over yet, and let's see what happens next. Now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of the house. Fill the men's sack with as much food as they can carry, and put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. Then put my cup the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest one sack, along with the silver for his grain. And he did as Joseph said. As morning dawned, the men uh, were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, go after those men at once, and when you catch up with them, say, why have you repaid good with evil? Isn't this the cup my master drinks from and also uses for divination? This is a wicked thing you have done. When he caught up with them, he repeated these words to them. But they said to him, Why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do anything like that. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver we found in the mouths of the sacks. So why would we steal silver or gold from your master? If any of your servants are found to have it, he will die. And the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. Very well, then, he said, let it be as you say. Whoever is found to have it will become my slave, and the rest of you will be free from blame. Each of them quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And at this they tore their clothes, which is a sign of grieving, And then they all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. And now they're going to face Joseph. 
Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in, and they threw themselves to the ground before him. Joseph said, what, what is this you have done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by divination? And then look, this is the important line, verse 16. What can we say to my Lord, Judah replied? What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has what? Uncovered your servant's guilt. And we are now my Lord's slaves. We ourselves and the one who is found to have the cup. I want you to think about what has just happened. They know they are innocent of the cup. But as they've been wrestling with their sin for the last two years, what have they come to realize now? The punishment they're going to receive to be slaves is a just punishment. They've come to terms with their sin, and they've owned it. And they said, this is our sin. And this is the next part of the test that Joseph wanted to see. Have accepted responsibility for their sin. And the scripture tells us, what do they get? An A. Come on. You should know the next answer that's coming up on the test. Now, let's keep going to the last part of the test and perhaps the most amazing part of the test. It goes like this. But Joseph said, far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who is found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you, go back to your father in peace. Look what Judah says. Then Judah went up to him and he said, pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak a word to my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servants, do you have a father or a brother? And we answered, we have an aged father. And there's a young son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead and he is the only one of his mother's son left and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me so that I can see him for myself. And we said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down here with you, you will not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him what my Lord had said. Then our father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we cannot go down only if our youngest brother is with us and will go. We cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them uh, went far away from me, and I said, He has surely been torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. So now if the boy is not with us, when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't here, he will die. Your servant will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. And so look what Judah says. Your servant, Judah, guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come to my father. Wasn't that amazing? Think about it. So tests have demonstrated true love. I give him an A+. Plus. Right? Because Jesus said there's no greater love than this to lay down your life for another. Earlier in life, Judah was willing to sell his brother he didn't like. But now, after 25 years, what does the test show? That when Benjamin set to be the slave, Judah says, Lord, let me take his place. This concludes the test that Joseph put before his brothers. And he is so moved by this act of love. In the next chapter, Joseph loses it. He reveals himself to his brothers. He cries. I'm going to talk more about that next week, okay? But did you see the test? Wasn't that amazing? And I want you to think for a second. Judah, over time, became the spokesman for the family. He was the one who spoke on behalf of the brothers in the story. But if you remember way back when we started talking about Joseph— of all the brothers, 
What brother was the most egotistical and selfish and sexist? You know who it was? It was Judah. It was Judah's ideal idea to sell Joseph. And after they sold Joseph, Judah couldn't deal with his pain. He ran away to a far off land. If you remember this story, he married this woman and then he basically abused, uh, uh, abused one of the, or abused her, however this works, and then he slept with his daughter and that was a whole big mess and I can't even say it right. So if you want to see that story, go back and see the story of Judah. But can you see how far God brought Judah in 25 years? Now for me, that gives me a lot of hope. Because it says if God can do that to a man like Judah, God can do anything for any human being. Now testing, as I said earlier, is a part of life. It's how our God works. Now yesterday, when I was, we were in the car ride, and actually even the day before, when I was talking with the students, they were hoping that I would mention them in the sermon today. I think because they were so proud of their hiking and their camping in the outdoors. And they were hoping I would show a couple pictures. So I figured out a way to tie them into the sermon. So I'm going to show you a couple pictures, okay? Uh, First picture. This is when we took off. My phone is a little messed up, so that particular picture is a little blurry. Um, But do you see the smiles? Do you see the energy and the vigor? And we're just about to hike roughly two and three quarters miles to our campsite. Um, Yesterday, before we took off, this is our group. You can see uh, we're just about to head back to the car. It's absolutely beautiful. They look a little more tired, but they're doing okay. Now for the last picture when we got home, I said, I want you to take a picture and and show us how you feel by your body language. And this was the picture (laughs) at the end. I was feeling it with them right there in the front. Now the funny thing was, is uh, is we went home I was talking to them, and you know, I was, I was so proud of how hard they had worked. And I said, I said hey, would you guys like to do this again? <laughs> and the answer was mostly yes, we'd like to, but not for another year. <laughs> <laughs> but what I started to explain to them, listen, I know that you are sore yesterday at the campsite. And I know that you're sore right now, and I know that you're going to wake up sore tomorrow morning. But you know what? If in one week from now, if you sleep well... And if you eat well, and if you have to do this hike again, I promise you it's going to be at least twice as easy. Because your body will strengthen, your body will heal, and your body will adjust. Why? Because testing, this is their testing of their endurance, testing makes you stronger. Now here's the thing. The 12 brothers, including Joseph, they needed to be tested. Why? Why? Because they had a hard journey ahead of them. God had great plans for those 12 brothers. They'd become the the 12 tribes of Israel. And God would use them in tremendous ways for a foundation of his people from which the Savior would come from. And it started pretty, it actually started right away. I don't know if you caught this nuance in the text, but when they were eating dinner, the text talked about how um, the, basically the Jewish people were detestable to the Egyptians. And also later, and you'll see this next week, is that uh, the Jewish people's main type of, of work was having cattle and being shepherds. And shepherds were detestable to the Egyptians as well. Basically, the Egyptians were racist. And so even when they're going to come, the 12 brothers are going to come live in the land of Egypt, you might notice that the 12 brothers aren't going to live right amongst the people. The 12 brothers and the land is given is going to be a special part of Egypt that is a part away from the Egyptians. In a way so God can protect them. But here's the thing. Those people are going to have to be strong Because they're going to grow up in the presence of people who don't like them, don't want anything to do with them, and someday they will become slaves. So God uses this testing to make them stronger. Now, just go back to your own life, because every message does not matter unless you can think about your own life and apply God's word to your story. You might be able to sit here right now, I just want you to ask yourself this question. How is God testing you right now? Just think about it for yourself. How's God testing you? Maybe a hardship. Maybe a relationship. Maybe, as I said earlier, an abundance of blessing. How's God testing you? God only tests you because he knows that through his strength, 
you have the power to overcome his testing. It's the only reason God tests you. He will always give you the strength to overcome the test that he puts before you. This can be your report card too if you let God take control. Remember Jesus Christ, um, in the beginning of his ministry, the scriptures say that the spirit led him into the wilderness to be tested. And in the wilderness, he fasted from food and water and Satan appeared and tempted Jesus over the course of that time. But while Jesus was being tempted and tested, whenever he hit that hardship, you know, the script, how did Jesus get through it? You know how he did? He leaned into the word of God. Because here's what a test does. It challenges us to think about what is actually true. What do we actually believe? And the reason Jesus could get through it is because he kept pointing to Satan. Satan would say something, but Jesus would say, no, but God says this. God says I'm his child. God says he'll take care of me. God says he's enough for me. And Jesus passed the test. And when he came out on the other side of the test, the scriptures say that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. God tested his son Jesus to prepare him for the ministry that he had. You can be confident that God loves you and he'll give you everything you need. You want to know why? Because even as Judah was willing to trade his life for his brother Benjamin, when God saw all of us as lost sheep, as sinners, as people who can never stand our own righteousness before God, God looked at us and said, you know what? My son who is perfect, I'm going to send him on a cross to die to take your place so that all who believe in my son, Jesus Christ, will be saved. The cross reminds us that God loves you more than you can possibly imagine, that he will always give you enough to get through the test that he gives you. And if you're here this morning, if you have not made a decision to follow Jesus and to find the strength and the hope and the comfort and the stamina and the perseverance and everything that you need for this life, I would ask you to pray about it and consider it. Because once you decide to follow Jesus, your life will never be the same. And God will continue to test you. But you will see that with Jesus, there's victory. And so with that, brothers and sisters, can we pray? God, we thank you. Um, As Job talked about, Lord, you, who are we that you are mindful of us, that you love us enough to test us? God, your love for us is more than we know. And out of your love, you test us on a regular basis. God, we pray for the wisdom to see the test before us so that we may choose uh, to follow you and to pass the tests that you bring us. Lord, if there is any brother or sister here this morning who's not made a decision to follow you, God, I just pray that you'd open their heart and open their eyes, that they would turn to you and find the salvation and the strength and everything they've ever needed right in your care.